but we want to extend a cordial welcome to all of you who may be visiting with us for the first time, whether you're here in person or you're watching the service online later this week, we welcome you. And if you're so moved, we'd love to have you complete an information card or if you're with us in person, or if you're watching online, we'd love to have you send us an email to our email website and let us know who you are so we can better communicate with you about the life of this wonderful summer congregation. Our service begins today with the singing of hymn number 423, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
fountain of all wisdom. You know our necessities before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness, and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened to the tent, into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice, flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took the curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where's your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Cheryl, Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I'll return to you, and Sarah shall have a son. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm this morning is Psalm number 15, found on page 599 of the Book of Common Prayer. We shall say Psalm 15 on page 599 responsibly by half verse. Lord, who made well in your tabernacle? Who made high on your holy hill? Whoever leads a blameless life and does what is right. Who speaks the truth from his heart? There is no guile upon his tongue. He does no evil to his friend. He does not need contempt upon his neighbor. In his sight, the wicked is rejected. But he honors those who fear the Lord. He has sworn to do no wrong. And he does not take back his word. He does not give his money in hope of gain. Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things shall never be overthrown. A reading from Colossians. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. 
He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might have come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. You who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, Christ Jesus has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we shall proclaim, warning and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Our gradual hymn is 488.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. For the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. <coughs> Sanctify us, O Lord, in truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Amen. One of the very earliest Western philosophers left a saying behind which was never forgotten. A person cannot step into the same river twice. <laughs> different water, different person. <clears throat> and this is the principle on which the church's lectionary is based. The same readings coming around every three years, but we're hearing them differently because the world is not quite the same. And neither are we as individuals and families. And this is certainly true of us as we negotiate the emergence from the COVID phase, where we're always saying things are so different now from how they were before. So this well-known story of Mary and Martha strikes my ear differently this year because of things I've experienced since I last preached on it six years ago here. <laughs> Let's just mention something obvious that's a bit difficult to face. With few exceptions, seniors are in the majority of most of our churches. And you will readily concur from personal experience that fewer and fewer people under 30 dream of coming to church for a community where they will find meaning and direction for their lives. And the statistics are pitiless showing how rapidly the proportion of young people claiming no attraction whatsoever to religion of any kind is mounting steadily year by year. Not long ago, I was doing a three-week renewal residency in a parish, and as one of the events, I convened a small group of people under 30 to share their feelings and hopes. There were some difficult things to have to listen to because some of them had really faced the barrier, consciously or unconsciously put in their path by older women and men who has given them the unmistakable impression that newcomers and young people have to earn leadership roles in the church over many years before they might possibly be given uh, a role to replace one of the older people who've been exchanging positions amongst themselves for decades. <laughs> Eventually you could replace us, it's been the hidden message. Typical unimaginative behavior of stolid institutions everywhere, but now literally fatal to the church lethal, because there is a crisis of viability which is now upon us, we're in the middle of it. There is now no time for anything eventually to happen. It will be now or it may be never. So in this meeting I started to talk about the difference between waiting to be given a voice in the church, given authority, and self-authorizing yourself to take leadership yourself and deliberately interpret to older generations 
the needs, aspirations, and hopes of your kind. And as soon as I mentioned this word self-authorization, you could come, you could sense a, a change in the energy in the room. It was quite palpable and startling. And suddenly, a rather remarkable young woman who had just come out of the Marines whipped out her cell phone and said, I think it's time we started a young adults group. And our next meeting will be, get your phones out. <laughs> Within 30 seconds, they fixed the time and the place for the following week. And the astonished priest who was sitting there said, now, do I need to be involved? And they all turned to him and said, we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I couldn't sleep that night because self-authorization had actually happened in the room before my very eyes. The very thing that I was raising as a sign of the spirit at work. Now, what has that got to do with today's gospel? Well, maybe everything. Because this story is about a young woman self-authorizing herself, taking authority and initiative, however strikingly controversial and unprecedented it would be. So controversial that they were remembered it, and it's ended up in our gospel. This is not about Mary having a private whim. Oh, what a great excuse to miss the kitchen chores. I'm listening on Jesus. It arose almost certainly because she had caught the spirit of urgency that permeated every word that Jesus spoke. It's so difficult for us to grasp that Jesus was not a teacher of timeless truths. He was not making ethical recommendations for the ages. Jesus was proclaiming that the time is now or never the very existence of the Jewish nation was at stake. Unless there was a radical turnaround, metanoia or repentance, the whole nation would walk along that broad path which was leading to destruction. They had to be going through the narrow gate of radical change immediately or the Romans would crush the entire fabric of Jewish nationhood and tear the temple down, which was its guaranteed symbol and center. To join Jesus' movement was a now or never thing. If you were going to join the band of the itinerant band, which was taking the message to every village and hamlet, that move to join would have to take prior priority over every other duty, let alone negotiating time out with your family. And we remember from one inquirer in Luke's Gospel, he wanted to attend his father's funeral, which would have taken a week. And Jesus said, no, let the dead bury the dead. I mean, that's how urgent things were. The whole message and proclamation of the reign of God has arrived is, there is now no more eventually. So Jesus is holding a training session for the young women and men who were leaders and partners in his reign of God movement. So Mary and Martha, it's a very pros a prosperous household this, have welcomed him to use their spacious home for the training session. And we know that this isn't just a party or casual conversation, because Luke specifically uses an expression telling us that this was a training going on. To say that you were sitting at the feet of a rabbi or a lord meant that you were apprenticing to them as a trainee for what they did. If you say, I sat at the feet of Rabbi Gamaliel, it means you were a pupil of theirs being trained and equipped for what they did. So this technical term tells us that Mary was saying, I want in on this and she steps up to it now in Jesus day women were so deprived of authority that they couldn't even function as witnesses in courts of law any more than children could be called to witness for not all women but for the vast majority of women 
their place was quite literally in the kitchen. But with the proclamation of the reign of God, women had an essential role to play in the forefront as leaders. And we tend to forget that Jesus' itinerant band wandering around was administered, financed, and organized by a group of very smart and quite wealthy women. This cadre is specifically named Joanna, wife of King Herod's household manager, Cruiser. Mary, mother of James, a lady called Salome, Mary of Magdala, and Susanna. They give a representative list of women without whom Jesus' itinerant band could not function. So what we see in today's gospel is another young woman authorizing herself to join this team by taking her first training with Jesus. But do notice very carefully, there's no indication that Jesus influenced her or invited her. He didn't sort of say, oh, come, you know, you come and join me. She took the initiative herself. She authorized herself to take a place as a trainee. And this self-validating authority is the very phenomenon that had amazed and scandalized people about Jesus himself. He was a hick from the Hicksville, Nazareth, a, a, a builder. So what? Buildish builder. He was not authorized as a rabbi. No one had given him any permission or license to take up the baton from John the Baptist movement once John the Baptist was imprisoned. No one had bestowed on him any kind of ordination or mandate to be a prophet. His authority came from somewhere else. Where? And Jesus would only say, if, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Like, it comes from Abba within me because I'm identified with him. The beginning of Mark's Gospel, we hear, they were all amazed and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. Authority, not as the scribes and Pharisees in the gospel said. And people were still trying to get at this two years later. The scribes, the Pharisees, and the elders came to Jesus and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who is it that gave you this authority? Jesus, of course, is very clever. He presses them for their answer. Well, what do you? What's your theory? What do you think? But because they're politicians, they sidestep. So they answered, they didn't know where it came from. So Jesus refuses to play the game, which is based on the premise that authority has to come from some human institution. Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And in response to the reign of God, Mary doesn't need someone to tell her that she could offer herself for leadership and ministry in what Jesus called, smilingly, God's little flock. She just had to go and do it. And every act of self-authorization is a provocation to convention, a provocation to the status quo. And Martha is very provoked by Mary's actions. And it wasn't just sisterly tension about chores. You see, in a culture, this is a woman's role is primarily in the kitchen. And her value consists doing her very best there in that role. Without Mary's help in fulfilling an ambitious menu of many courses, we hear lots of stories about Jewish mothers and Italian mothers who are identified with what the table looks like on a festival or Sunday. Martha's identified with this role. This is where women are at their best in the kitchen, providing this symbol of abundance. Without that, with everything boiling over on the stove, the results would only be second best. So resentment erupts not unknown between sisters. Now, I would be a very rich man if every time I preached 
I got $10 for every uh, someone who comes up in the coffee, Aaron says. I think Jesus got it wrong this time. Jesus being mean and unfair to Martha. I'm on the road to that organizes our, uh, fest our festive meals and so on, and I don't like this gospel, you know, so. I think, here we go, if I have $10 for every this, I go on a cruise. I recently heard of a seminarian at the um, um, Virginia Theological Seminary who had preached a, her, a sermon on this title, on this passage, which she titled, Jesus Makes the Wrong Call Again. <laughs> it's the again that frightens me a bit. <laughs> But Jesus' words are not belittling or disparaging the practical work of those who do their very best catering for the community's gatherings. Jesus is frighteningly single-minded. He stays on message about the urgency of the news of the reign of God. And his, the, the candor with which he says, everybody's priorities change when they fall under the magnetic attraction of God's reign. You see, in ordinary times, in stable circumstances, where business as usual and the predictable cycle of the community's rituals continues its conventional round, certain things are expected. A woman's place is in the kitchen, and doing one's best is pleasing people with an array of offerings. But now, what we've come to call a tipping point, a very useful expression for understanding Jesus' ministry. Now a tipping point has arrived in our own era, and suddenly we have to decide what takes priority over our usual roles and routines. Jesus validates Mary's self-authorizing defiance of convention. She has chosen the better part to equip herself for proclaiming God's reign, and she isn't going to let anyone pull her back. Now, as some of you know, I've married into a huge, sprawling black family, and my husband is African American. And we went together once to the, that uh, lovely musical of the 60s, Hallelujah Baby. Anyone seen it? <laughs> So in this uh, lovely musical, Georgina is a young African-American maid in a South Carolina plantation, basically. But she has a great ambition to be a star and an entertainer, to be on the stage and, and to be wonderful. And quite early on in the musical, her mother, really the kind of Martha figure in the story, sings a song whose chorus is Back in the kitchen. <laughs> so, this is a standing joke between me and my husband. And sometimes in his deep voice, he will point to me ironically. And say, Back in the kitchen. And, and we laugh. But it's not quite a, a laughing matter. It's just that our racial tropes of who belongs where and whose talent is allowed to flourish and bloom is very much um, at the center of this story and of our racial dynamics. Maybe this is one of those stories that an African-American woman will be the best in the telling. So Jesus' words of validation, look, she's chosen the better part and no one's going to take it from her, speak to us now of the church's crisis of viability. In conventional days, we don't need to make many choices. They are made for us by the traditions of the community and its unspoken rules. But now, no one's exempt. We have to face choices. And these choices are going to involve a lot of stripping down to essentials. Stripping down our usual practices and expectations, which were all very well in their day. But now we have to focus on what has genuine centrality and priority. The church has so often sung to itself soothing reassurances that things will come round eventually. 
I remember in my early days of ministry, people said, well, of course the young people leave when they go to college. But eventually, just you see, when they marry, they'll come back again eventually. No, it's not happening. There is no eventually now. As we know for the climate crisis facing the planet, soothing voices say that eventually we'll get this all sorted out are being literally burnt up in the blaze of heat and fire. There is no eventually now when we face the blast of real choices. There is only now, and the demand is to change our ways and priority in the light of God's reign, which is the world as it will be when God has God's way, which is a way of sharing compassion, imagination, and abundance, pushing back the forces of greed, violence, and literalism. to stand and affirm our voice in the proclamation of the faith of the church, nice and clean, on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that they have seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through which all things were made, for us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate, He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the gods. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people this morning are found on page 392 of the Book of Common Prayer, following Form 6. You may remain standing for the prayers, you may kneel, or you may be seated and bowed for the prayers as you were able. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who are for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Thomas, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in the church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. We pray, we pray.
pray for the gathering of the worldwide bishops of the Anglican Communion in Canterbury, a blessing on their deliberations and safety and travel for a thousand bishops coming from all over the globe. Pray for Polly. For the suffering people of Ukraine and other war-torn areas, for the conversion of those who make war and profit from it. Hear us, Lord. Mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise his name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. For Jane. For the victims of war and famine, and all those who have died without anyone to pray for them. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy, mercy upon us, us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins. No, no and undone. Things done and not undone. And so, so hold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in the midst of this life. To the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins, strength through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us greet us one another discreetly. Discreetly. <laughs> 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 So on this my second Sunday, I would like to give you a very heartfelt expression of gratitude for honoring me with an, yet another invitation to join you in the summer. And this is a place in which, uh, not only a beloved place and a lovely time, but I do feel very loved by a congregation that I've come to love and respect very deeply. Uh, this, uh, this is a wonderful place, and we are, uh, this is a gathering to be humbled by and joyful in. Now, uh, we certainly have some guests here that aren't, as it were, regulars. We'd like to welcome them. If they'd like to just stand up and tell us where they're from and who they are, we'd like to uh, greet you. So, starting on this side. Well, I'm Graham. My parents here are from here. Very good, and good friend of mine. There you go. <laughs> welcome, welcome. On this side, people who are relatively new. <laughs> Arlene from um, the Villages of the Mar and Rich. Wonderful, welcome. Hi, I'm Ken Swanton with my brother Jack, with my wife and my sister from uh, we're on Westport Island. Wonderful. Thank you, see. So a few notices, uh, continuing with the uh, general caution, we are administering Holy Communion only in the form of the consecrated bread. When you come to Communion, the ushers will welcome you from the back, not the front. So don't be surprised if you find people coming up this way. And we ask you to fill in the whole row, starting at this side. And if you are able, and going to exit from the side door, 
it helps with the traffic, as it were. Um, the flowers today are given to the glory of God by Cindy Woodruff. And um, one of the last acts of the Bishop of Maine, Thomas our Bishop, before packing their bags for Lambeth, was to come and visit me here on South Port Island. We had a very nice feast on the deck overlooking the ocean of Cape Logan, and he sends his greetings and blessings to you. And I would like you to take seriously in your prayers this rather critical meeting of bishops, which has had to be postponed for several years because of COVID. So over 12 years has lapsed, and much has changed since the bishops of our communion gathered. And so please, in your daily prayers, remember them and ask for wisdom and guidance. Uh, they are quite uh, dramatic experiences, as I know from being a chaplain to the Lambeth Conference in 1998, which was a turbulent and time that has left me with many memories. <laughs> so I know that prayer is very much needed for these gatherings. Are there any other uh, notices that we want to share? Community? I think we're all done, and so our real announcement, of course, is always the announcement that the reign of God is amongst us, and that where two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus is here amongst us, and is eagerly anticipating coming into our hearts afresh in his own gift of his true self, his body and his blood. So whether you were looking forward to church, Jesus was looking forward to it much more. <laughs> and so let us prepare in our hearts for that reopening of our hearts to his living presence amongst us and within us. Offer to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good your vows to the Most High.
prayer for the Eucharist will be found on page 367. Uh, <coughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Hallelujah. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Our prayer of thankfulness is found on page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as the members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food, and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to all that we serve you, with gladness and singleness of our heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Before the blessing to invitations, please join us if you can for refreshments on the deck in the ocean breezes after the service. And there will be, of course, on Tuesday at 9 o'clock, a Bible study which will enable people to review what impression the Scriptures has made this week and to look forward to those appointed the next week. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn, 383. <laughs>